It's the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Mike McIntyre. Thank you so much for joining us. Norfolk Southern Railroad has agreed in principle to pay $600 million to settle class action claims filed after last year's toxic train derailment. But some in East Palestine question whether it'll be enough to cover all the damage. The United States Environmental Protection Agency has announced new standards to limit forever chemicals in drinking water systems. Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose says President Biden is in danger of being left off the November ballot because the Democratic National Convention is less than 90 days before the election. And Ohio law says names must be set 90 days out and Biden won't officially be nominated yet. Democrats in Ohio say there's zero chance the president won't be on the ballot. And Akron Mayor Shamas Malik said during his first State of the City speech that Akron police will no longer engage in chases for vehicle equipment violations. More policy changes regarding crowd control and the use of chemical spray are coming. Joining me to talk about these stories and a ton more from IdeaStream Public Media, Akron Canton reporter Anna Huntsman and environmental reporter Zaria Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you both. And in Columbus, Ohio Public Radio Statehouse News Bureau Chief Karen Kassler is with us. Hey, Karen. Hey, good morning. Good morning to you. We don't take calls on the roundtable, but do share your thoughts or ask questions via email. SOI at ideastream.org is the address. I'm also checking out Twitter throughout the program, so you can go ahead and I'm checking for my phone. Yeah, there it is. So you can go ahead and tweet at us throughout the show, too. And that is at Sound of Ideas. All right, let's get ready to roundtable. Norfolk Southern has agreed, as I said, to pay $600 million in a settlement in the East Palestine toxic train derailment. If approved by the court, it would settle class action claims brought by businesses and individuals following the February 2023 train derailment. Critics say it's not enough, and it also doesn't hold Norfolk Southern accountable for the disaster. Sorry, uh, how many plaintiffs are we talking about in this class action, and what's been the reaction to the proposal? Yeah, the number of residents in the class action lawsuit is estimated to be in the thousands. After the derailment, the chemical spill, and the controlled burn of chemicals last year, residents in East Palestine and the surrounding communities filed separate lawsuits that were eventually consolidated into one. The plaintiffs' attorneys, when it comes to the reaction, they feel this is a fair and reasonable outcome, especially considering the amount of the settlement and the sort of quick turnaround to get to this point um, compared to like other similar cases in the past. Um, so their outlook is more positive than maybe some of the residents might be now. Yeah, I heard some folks, some on, on national NPR residents saying, uh, it's first of all, it's not enough that it ends up when you spread it out to be pennies per. But there's a really big sticking point about the company saying, yeah, you know, no liability here. Exactly. Yeah, they're not taking any liability, wrongdoing, or fault on Norfolk Southern with this settlement. And Abigail Botar actually spoke to Jamie Wallace with the Unity Council for the East Palestine train derailment, who was pretty disappointed with the amount and with the fact that they are kind of skirting around accountability when it comes to the public health effects and the environmental health effects that are sort of still being seen in the community. She also so Jamie Wallace did in uh, a number of interviews compared the 600 million to the amount of bonuses that are paid to the executives of Norfolk Southern oh, yeah. and was like, you know, this is pretty much peanuts. Right, right. Um, if approved by the court, the payments could begin this year, though. Um, how will they decide who gets what? So they're going to take into consideration like any sort of... Uh costs or damages or property damage, loss of business revenue, decline in property value, or even uh, receipts for like host hotel stays during that evacuation period. And um, it's going to involve like uh, court appointed counsel, meeting with court appointed counsel to determine how much people are going to get, people or business owners in East Palestine and surrounding communities, and then taking into consideration any sort of documentation for um, cost. Separately, there there are injury claims, health claims, and as I understand, it's a ten mile radius for that. But people could literally fill out things saying, "Here's what my injury is," and be compensated for those as well. Right, right. Uh, Norfolk Southern, for its part, has said it's already spent 104 million dollars in the community relief to East Palestine, the surrounding areas. 25 million for a regional safety training center. 25 million in improvements to the city park. 21 million in direct payments to residents. Nine million to local first responders. What the company is basically saying is, we we made a mistake. Obviously, this accident happened. We've been paying, and now here's even more. They're they're saying, look at how much we're giving. Mm -hmm. But if you're in that area impacted for a long time, uh, I don't know how much would be enough. Yeah, and it, it does raise the concern of like these these residents, a lot of them still have like ongoing health concerns, ongoing long-term environmental concerns that are making them feel like less safe in their communities. So it's kind of hard to put a monetary value on that. The National Transportation Safety Board is expected to have its final report in the coming months. So we haven't seen the total on that yet right. either. 
Right. Yeah, that's expected to come in June. Uh, but safety officials previously said that the derailment may have been caused by an overheated wheel bearing on one of the train cars. So we'll just have to see if that finding is accurate when the report comes out and what else you know is in there. Now, one thing we should point out is it is a class action, but people don't all have to agree to be in that class action. So while there's $600 million for everyone that agrees to be in it and they'd get that share, you could be somebody who's a plaintiff with a claim that says, I'm not in that class mm-hmm. action. I'm still pursuing my suit against you. Yeah, exactly. So any plaintiff in the suit who who kind of isn't down with the settlement or doesn't doesn't fully agree with it, they are um, able to object to the settlement. Um, but attorneys have said that if um, enough people object or if too many people object, Norfolk Southern can decide to take the whole settlement off the table. So it's kind of, uh, you know, weighing the the pros and cons here, I guess, for those plaintiffs. Certainly that number, that $600 million made national news mm-hmm, uh, right. when, when the company offered that. I would assume that that shows a certain level of responsibility. But again, in it, it says it doesn't say this was our fault. Yeah. And, you know, when, when we spoke with attorneys, they, they kind of felt that the monetary amount was kind of taking responsibility in some ways. But the settlement itself, again, is, is kind of not putting that on them. So. All right. We got a lot of environmental stuff, which is one of the reasons that you're here to yes. lead off our show today. <laughs> the U.S. EPA this week announced new standards to limit so-called forever chemicals in public drinking water systems. Chemicals are collectively known as PFAS or per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Zaria, the new standards are legally enforceable, and what I understand from Michael Reagan, who is the uh, the EPA administrator mm-hmm. in the U.S., is that it's life-changing. It's the first time we've seen this kind of action. Yeah, it's uh, the first time we've seen the national drinking water limits for PFAS specifically, and it's been a long time coming. So, you know, this this has kind of been in the works for a while, and a lot of environmental organizations have been pushing for something like this for a long time. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's uh, restricting the amount of uh, PFAS, which is a class of harmful chemicals that is allowed to be in our drinking water, and it defines these maximum contaminant levels or just maximum amounts that are allowed to be in the water for several different types of PFAS. And then separate limits will be set on mixtures of PFAS and drinking water as well. And the EPA, they say they expect between 6 and 10 percent of public water systems to be in violation and need to do some sort of work to get into compliance with the new standards. Um, but they're also saying that they're expecting, I think, between as much as 100 million people to be uh, to benefit from this rule. So 100 million people that would be perfect, protected yeah. from the PFAS exposure. Right. The question, though, is this is not going after for example, the companies that make PFAS. This Mm -hmm. is not going after somebody who's spilling, you know, give it, it's a broad thing, but I'm spilling PFAS into the, into the system. And so I get dinged for that. What this is, is it's going to public water systems and saying, it's your job to to catch this at the gate. Exactly. Public water systems are saying that's going to cost us a ton of money. Yeah. And you know, it, I've started having some conversations with local public water systems, but it does seem like when it comes to uh, some of the treatment options for the PFAS treatment processes, the cost is pretty expensive when compared to like the current treatment processes they're doing. And it's relative to the size of the public water system, but it does seem like if they have to implement these treatment options that it'll be more expensive for them, but that could lead to some trickle down to more expensive rates for customers as well. Part of this is many millions of dollars are going to be Uh, opened up and provided for the public water systems through the bipartisan infrastructure law, Mm -hmm. too. So there is some money for in order for them to do that. They need to start testing within the next three years. There'll be money to be put into there. But they're saying some of the retrofits and, you know, if you're going to catch this particular kind of contaminant, it's going to cost a whole lot of money to make sure that your plant can do that. Yeah. And then when it comes to that funding that's available to them to do the testing and the treatment uh, process upgrades, like that's going to be through grant funding. So these public water systems will also have to apply for those grants. And then that raises the question for some of these public water systems, if they're large enough or have the capacity or the staff to get all that grant application materials together to send it off and then hopefully get some money to make those changes. What about people that have private wells? Are they impacted by these standards? Well, they're not under the same obligation as the public water systems to be at those uh those maximum contaminant levels, but they are eligible to apply for that same $1 billion of federal grant funding so that if they want to test their private wells to see if they have PFAS or if they know that their private well has PFAS, then they'll be able to apply and then make any changes if they get the funding. Anna? Anna Huntsman here, just sitting here listening (laughs) all about science. I love it. Well, I just had a question for you, Zaria, because you've been following PFAS and IdeaStream. You and a team of others did a whole series about Mm -hmm. PFAS earlier this year. So I was just genuinely curious, did you see this coming, this kind of breaking news update about new PFAS regulations? (laughs) I did not see this coming. I I guess since we had our series, I had just pivoted to some other things. And then PFAS news was coming 
kind of trickling in and coming up. Um, but when it came to this week, I didn't expect the announcement this week, but luckily I'm plugged into some NPR climate channels and that's kind of how it came onto our radar. So we were prepared for it, but it wasn't, I wasn't expecting it this week, especially after Eclipse Day. Mm. I think I, I thought I'd have a little bit of time to... No time. Yeah. <laughs> How uh, how have we how have the reaction been from people who have been fighting about this issue? People that you quoted in the in the series of mm-hmm. stories that we did, and environmental groups in general. How have they reacted? Yeah, I mean, for the envir- and for the environmental groups, like I mentioned, they've been kind of on the PFAS front for years, if not decades, trying to push for legislation like this. So um, the the atmosphere so far has been pretty celebratory for um, stakeholders on this front. Um, now that we have a f- the f- again for the first time federal PFAS drinking water standards, um, but I want to say that they also mentioned that the work on the PFAS front is not over. Like you said, Mike, we're, they aren't targeting people who are creating PFAS or people who are pushing PFAS into our water bodies. So um, they, it, it seems like work remains to be done when it comes to um, targeting PFAS and other sources and maybe preventing them from getting into water in the first place. And this is an example where the government is stepping in and saying, the federal government is stepping in and saying everyone's going to have to do this. Until Wednesday, until this was announced, 11 states had already set these enforceable maximum contaminant levels for drinking water. Mm -hmm. Ohio is not one of those. Right, right. And and again, in some conversations I've had with local public water systems, it seems like they're expecting for the Ohio EPA to sort of follow the federal EPA's footsteps and either come out with their own um, regulation that echoes the EPA's regulation, or they do have the opportunity to be a little bit more strict with their own PFAS drinking water guidelines. They just can't be any more lenient. So they're either going to be the same or more strict. All right. Great info. Thanks for uh, carrying the top of the show today. No problem. I'm happy to. (laughs) Let's go to uh, Columbus now. Sam Randazzo, the former chair of the Public Utilities Utilities Commission of Ohio, was found dead this week in Columbus. Authorities say it was an apparent suicide. The 74-year-old faced both state and federal charges for his alleged involvement in the bribery scandal connected to the passage of the energy policy legislation known as House Bill 6. Karen, how does Randazzo's death impact the investigations of cases moving forward that are, he's got two, two charges against him, state and federal, and then there are charges against others as well. How does this impact any of that? Well, his death is just a, a tragedy. I mean, this this story five years on is still, it has no sign of coming to an end. And this is potentially the second person involved in the House Bill 6 nuclear power plant bailout scandal who apparently died by suicide, Neil Clark, who was a lobbyist who was arrested in the initial arrest back in June of 2020. He, his death was ruled a suicide in March of 2021. So this this is just, it's, it's a terrible story that just seems to keep getting worse. And according to Attorney General Dave Yost, who filed the state's charges in this case, the death of Sam Randazzo doesn't do anything to the case. He says the case continues to go forward. Uh, Randazzo, along with former First Energy executives Chuck Jones and Michael Dowling, were accused in Summit County Court in February, and they pleaded not guilty. And just to refresh everybody's memory, the accusation is that Randazzo took a $4.3 million bribe from First Energy to write part of House Bill 6. And of course, First Energy uh, benefited from House Bill 6 because a subsidiary of that company owned Ohio's two nuclear power plants. And House Bill 6 was the bill that would have created a billion dollar subsidy for those plants, though that subsidy has now been removed from the law. Tragically, you mentioned Randazzo's death. He's the second person involved in this scandal to die by suicide. Yeah, and it's it's just it's a story that just like I said keeps getting worse. It's Democrats this week at the state of the state pointed out that there have been no laws that have changed that would prevent a future House Bill six type scandal from going forward. And this scandal has been called the largest corruption scandal in state history. And it's just the the impact on this has been just so huge on the families of the people involved. I'm I'm not saying anyone should feel sorry for anybody directly accused in this case, though certainly Randazzo, Jones, and Dowling have pleaded not guilty. Larry Householder is, of course, in prison for 20 years, the former Ohio House Speaker, the former chair of the Republican Party, Matt Borges, in prison for five years. So the impact of this has been tremendous on them and their families, but also the potential impact on Ohioans. I mean, if House Bill 6 were still in law all of it, most of it's still there, but the nuclear power plant subsidiary part is gone. 
all Ohio ratepayers would have been on the hook to pay this money and a billion dollars over uh, 10 years. There's still subsidies right now in House Bill 6 that go to coal fire power plants that everybody's paying. So this is just the story, like I said, seems to have no end in sight. Yeah, and Karen, uh, to to make a point on that, to call someone's death by suicide a tragedy is not at all then relating to, um, I endorse the the activity that they did. I mean, clearly there uh, there was a, a, an ac- accusation there. If he was convicted of that, we'd have that clearly. It's also not a capital offense. Well, and and certainly the reasons for suicide are personal. And, of course, a reminder that anybody who's in crisis or knows someone in crisis should reach out to 988, the National Suicide Hotline. Uh, but the, 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 the decision to do that is it's so permanent. It's so real. And for two people in this case to apparently have made that decision is just it's it's it, it's extraordinarily awful. All right, Karen, thanks for the update on that. We'll obviously be continuing to cover uh, all of the legal ramifications of the House Bill 6 scandal. And as Karen mentioned, if you or someone you know is struggling with the mental health crisis, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. All right, we're going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, we're going to talk about Akron Mayor Shamas Malik and his first State of the City speech, criticism surrounding the city's search for a new police chief, and some new police procedures that he's putting in place. This is the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable. I'm Mike McIntyre. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable from Idea Stream Public Media. I'm really appreciative that you're here. And I'm Mike McIntyre, joined this week by Zaria Johnson and Anna Huntsman. Appreciative that they're here as well. They're from Idea Stream. And State House News Bureau Chief Karen Kassler is with us as well. Always appreciate you, Karen. Thank you for being here. Of course. (laughs) Before we get back to the roundtable, it's quiz time. I hope you've been taking the quiz, Karen. If you haven't, I need you to log on and start doing that. All right. Ideastream.org. You can also (laughs) find it in our newsletter. There. All right. So we've got an agreement. If if all of you would just say all right like Karen, then this would be good. All right. All right. All right. I know. Uh, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I got my this, orders. <laughs> you can find this week's news quiz at ideastream.org slash quiz, but wait until the show's over so you're armed with all the information to make a stellar showing. I took it today, I think, almost maybe two of the questions we aren't talking about on this show. So you're, you're going to get a good head I start. I thought you were okay, about good. to say that you missed two questions. I know. I was no, like, uh, of course not. No. I mean, you know, I would, no judgment, but you should probably, judgment. of anyone here, you should yes. be the one to ace it. Let me tell you something. Of all people, <laughs> I would be the first person to never admit that I missed one. Right. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> <laughs> the quiz makers are crafty. They uh, Actually, frankly, I did. I missed one last week. Um, <gasps> I know. Uh, to make sure it doesn't happen to you, listen often and make sure to check out ideastream.org for all kinds of important web stories. Because I'll tell you, the one that I did miss was a web story that wasn't written from our newsroom but was carried on our web page and I missed it. Excuse me. That'll get you. That'll get yeah, you. I'll, I'll remember this for life. And I've admitted it. All right. Let's move on. Secretary, <laughs> Secretary of State Frank LaRose says President Joe Biden could be kept off the Ohio ballot this November unless Democrats, uh, Democrats change their national convention dates or unless an existing state law is changed. Ohio's law requires presidential candidates to be certified for the ballot 90 days before the election. And this year that would be August 6th. But the Democrats won't formally nominate Biden until the party convention, which begins August 19th. So there's a disparity there. Karen, it's not the first time the party convention dates have been an issue for the existing law. 2016, both parties held conventions after the certification deadline, but they got around it then with a, with a little bit of a quick legislation. Yeah, and that was actually apparently known in 2019 because it was that fix was added to the budget in 2019 so that in 2020 neither party would be affected because conventions of course the dates are announced before the event so they're announced fairly far in advance so that the communities that are hosting them can get ready for them so the law that this all comes from was passed in 2010 and it was widely agreed upon but this part this 90 day deadline the deadline had been either 70 or 75 days it was moved to 90 days and it kind of got very little notice when it happened and so it's happened twice now where both parties their conventions have been after the 90 day deadline and in 90 days is a really long time i mean like you said it's it's going to be in early august a lot of time the conventions are held late july early august sometimes even late august and into september so now the question is what's going to be done about this because certainly the idea of ohio not having 
President Biden as the Democratic candidate for president on the Ohio fall ballot seems really a big deal. And Ohio is not the only state that's facing this. Apparently it's happening in Alabama as well. The question is going to be what's going to happen, what is going to change, and, and whether lawmakers, Republicans who lead the legislature, are going to go ahead and push forward on this and, and make some change. And what they'd push forward with would be uh, saying it's 60 days for this year yes. or something like, like that. But let's note that this is an issue for the Democratic nominee, not the Republican nominee, because the Republican convention is earlier and it's, it's within that parameter then. Right. And this is the first time only one convention has been affected. And you know, certainly you could ask the question about the 90 day deadline and whether that's too far. I mean, this came in a law that really dealt with how Ohio would pay benefits to veterans of the Persian Gulf, Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Voters had approved those bonuses, but this was a bill that would create how Ohio would pay those bonuses. And so this was buried in the in the midst of that bill. And the 90-day deadline is, like I said, it's a long time. Democrats say the legislative fix is not the only option that they're looking into. There are other things that are possibly out there. But certainly the time is of the essence. LaRose's letter to Democrats said if there is a legislative fix, it has to happen before May 9th. And we are now, what, April 12th? Well, <laughs> so about not that. a lot of time. <laughs> about, about that. So when you talked about in 2019, there was plenty of advance notice because it was both of the conventions. And so there was some legislation passed and, and it was fixed. But in this case, the Republican is fine. The Democrat is the one that might be put off. And Secretary of State Frank LaRose doesn't mention it until now. His office says, we're busy with the primary. But there are a lot of eye rolls going on in the State House about how a Republican uh, Secretary of State has now sort of done this very, what they consider very last minute. Well, and, and certainly the idea that he just ran in a very partisan and, and expensive and bitter U.S. Senate primary certainly comes up. Uh, the Democratic National Convention, which is in Chicago in late August, it's the date's been set for about a year. And so, yeah, you could certainly say, hey, the Secretary of State should have let the Democrats know. But also you could say, hey, why didn't Democrats check mm -hmm. with the 50 states that they represent and, and that they intend to be on the ballot in and make sure that they're following all the laws? Uh, La Rosa's office says they have lawyers who are doing that. They're paid well to do these sorts of things. It's 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 a tough situation, and the time frame is really close. I mean, at this point, it's it's do something or potentially risk not having Biden on the ballot, which just seems unthinkable. And you mentioned the U.S. Senate race. Frank LaRose was involved in the primary, but we're talking about the race now with the incumbent Democrat, Sherrod Brown, and he's going up against Bernie Marino, um, the Clevelander, and Northeast Ohioan uh, as well, a businessman. But if President Biden is not at the top of the Democratic ticket, the thinking is that suppresses the Democratic vote in general. And so that could affect very greatly the Senate race. Oh, absolutely. I mean, not having whoever your presidential candidate is in a presidential year on the ballot would certainly have a tremendous impact on all of the down ticket races. And so obviously, it's one of the reasons why Democrats want to make sure that Biden's on the ballot. The chances of Biden winning Ohio just from trends and, and that sort of thing, really are low. But his presence on the ballot does potentially bring in more people to vote, and it potentially helps Democratic candidates. So at least that's the view that the Democrats have, and they're trying to make sure that he is on the ballot. All right. Well, thank you for following that for us. And it'll be, a, as you said, a story that develops pretty quickly. Yeah, and it's interesting that the story broke on a Friday afternoon, and it made it difficult to follow it over the weekend. It's kind of one of those stories that gets buried on a Friday, and you, you have to wonder, this is a big, big deal. For those not in the business, we call that a Friday afternoon news dump. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time. All right. Uh, Akron Mayor Shamas Malik announced during his first State of the City speech, which was not on a Friday afternoon, that police will no longer chase drivers for vehicle equipment infractions. He also said the city next year will begin a participatory budgeting process where citizens help decide where some public money is spent on a limited number of projects. And uh, also, we talk about the search for a police chief, and that's now down, apparently, to two deputy chiefs in the Akron Police Department. Uh, the public will soon get a say on them, but there's been a lot of criticism to the mayor, and he's been responding to it, that he should open up the search. Correct. And yes, and they actually did announce that there would be uh, two community forums where the public can um, get a, 
can ask questions directly of the candidates. And that was announced in a Friday uh, afternoon. It was. Okay. There you go. Uh, But uh, but other than that, yes. So this has been an ongoing uh, talking point for the past few weeks now, this police chief search, because essentially the mayor says he ran into a roadblock where uh, he can only hire internally for the police chief. And he's pointing to a a state law that uh, basically says it must come through promotions. Other cities have not followed that. They have used other rules and whatnot. But he says there isn't a city law on the books that could uh, supersede that. So because of that, the highest ranking officers are the only ones that can be considered at this point because they both applied. And so it's two deputy chiefs, uh, Jesse Leeser and uh, Brian Harding, who is currently the acting chief. And while the mayor says he respects them and, and, you know, they've had long careers in the department and he's happy with that. Uh, they're both white men. And essentially, there's been this call for a very long time for police reform in Akron, reforming the department. And the black elected officials of Summit County are saying, we need to have a more diverse pool of candidates for this. And not just a more diverse pool of candidates, but a more diverse police force. Absolutely. Right. So they're calling for that. They're saying that you really can't make change if you don't see um, people that look like you in, in the department that's, that's policing the city. And now uh, the mayor did say that this is the most the police department is the most diverse it's ever been. I mean, it's obviously still, uh, I think only, oh gosh, I can't remember the percentage, but it's less than 20% mm-hmm. uh, uh, people in the department are are black. Um, and so, so, yeah, absolutely, that's what's been going on. Mayor spent a lot of time on public safety, the police department as well. The thing that jumped out to me, the key change, was that uh, there would no longer be pursuits of vehicles for ve- for vehicle equipment infractions. And in fact, that was the genesis of the Jalen Walker yep. chase that ended up in his death. In my opinion, this was maybe the biggest news to come out of his State of the City speech. Um, this is this is a change that has been called for for some time, and the former police chief had said they were working on it, potentially thinking of changing the policy, and now it's here. They will no longer chase for minor things like a broken taillight, uh, a broken mirror. And as you mentioned, that's what started the, uh, the whole situation with Jalen Walker, is he had a broken taillight, and then he didn't stop, and then there was a police chase, and, you know, it ended in, unfortunately... Um, um, him being fatally shot by police. And so and that and that has sparked so much of this call for police reform in the city, you know, over the past few years. So that was a big change. Um, and he said that there are some other things coming down the line, such as what how police can um, do crowd control at, at protests and, and large demonstrations, using, pepper spray and that using kind of chemical stuff. irritants, which has been deployed in the past, um, including on our own reporters here. So um, so that's that's coming down the pike. Uh, right now, the in fact today, I think there's going to be a press conference about this. Or some, I heard something on um, on the air with Amy Eddings this morning. Uh, the Akron Police Department has a shooting situation. Yeah. Fifteen year old uh, teen who survived the shooting was shot in the hand, but. This is not an equipment violation. It was a call that someone was pointing gu- a gun at houses. It turns out it was a, a fake gun, which mm-hmm. the kid kept saying. But the question here is whether the police officer acted too rashly in shooting. Yeah, the body cam footage was released on Monday. And from what we can tell, it seems like the officer uh, pulls up and says, hey, can where are you going? Hey, can I see your hands? And then you hear the, the shot. So we can't really see what was going on. We can only really see the window of the um, police car in the footage. Footage, but it it looks like it happened very quickly. So um, that is something that people are are really up in arms about here in in the city um, is whether that happened too quickly, um, whether the teen already had his hands up, or whether he did, still had the gun. In the video, you can see the fake gun um, lying on the ground after the they. they um, after he shot. After he shot, and there. Yeah, I was trying to think of the word. They put handcuffs on him at first, and all that. Got it. Um, a couple of other things about the state of the city, and one other thing about violence. The mayor noted that gun violence in the city is a concern and that he's going to be deploying something uh, in the summer that he hopes will head that off. It's a called a, a street team where it's people that are um, trained, but they also maybe have had experiences in the criminal justice system, experiences with gun violence, and they'll actually just kind of go out into neighborhoods and talk to community members. So it's not a police it's a it's a messengers go that's what they're called they go out into the community and have these conversations i thought 
participatory budgeting was interesting because in Cleveland that was a big yeah. hullabaloo and then ended up not happening. The mayor says they're going to give it a try there. It sounds like it's limited to a number of projects in certain wards. It's in the very early stages of the process. This kind of, I mean, the mayor has talked about this a little bit this year so far, but um, they he actually presented the budget to the community before um, it was voted on by city council. And um, I was at those meetings and a lot of people were saying, man, we have a lot of thoughts, but it doesn't seem like this is going to go anywhere because this needs to be passed by the end of March. So the community was asking, hey, can we see this sooner? And so the mayor has said, yes, we absolutely, this next budget cycle, maybe in the summer, um, when we're starting to look at the capital budget, what the city's going to invest in, um, could we maybe take it to ward meetings and have each ward vote on a project that they that they really care about? So there are really no details yet, but the mayor is, is ext- he seems to be really interested in it and in some form. And last thing, the city is seeking input on how to transform the inner belt. Big topic in Akron. Oh, yeah. This is a decommissioned stretch of a highway that never ended up panning out than it, when it was build, built. But uh, it, it decimated a community because all these businesses and homes in a predominantly black area were uh, had to be taken out in, in order to build that highway. And so now it just sits there. Um, and there have been conversations for years now of what to do. And could we empower the uh, community that was affected by it in this process? So now what he's looking at is uh, basically taking proposals of what could be done. Um, community members have a lot of different ideas, so they do want to hear from the public, but they're, they're going to be looking at some proposals in the coming years. Excellent. The Legal Aid Society of Cleveland has filed a complaint with the city's housing court on behalf of tenants of St. Clair Place Apartments in downtown Cleveland. The 200-unit complex is intended for low-income seniors, people with disabilities, but tenants say they don't feel safe in the apartments. The exterior door is busted, so people are in there doing all kinds of nasty things in the place where these older people live. Mm -hmm. At a news conference, they painted a picture this week, Zaria, of a building in decline, cited troubling issues, and they're just not getting addressed. Yeah, so they specifically highlighted some safety and some sanitary issues. Um, They do have that exterior door uh, problem, but one resident described the building as a third world and others said the problem only keeps getting worse with management turnover. They're saying that any or many maintenance and safety issues aren't being addressed, including that entryway door. And that entryway door has led to um, strangers entering the building, strangers sleeping in stairwells and people participating in sexual and drug related activities in mm. common areas. So they got in touch with legal aid and uh, legal aid is on fire on this because they they have a machine there. They know how to get people to pay attention to things. And so legal aid not only is working in the court, but also in the court of public opinion, having this press conference yesterday, um, really trying to advocate for these residents. Yeah. And they're hoping that that um, resident first housing code will be looped into this somewhere down the line. Um, So they've reached out to the the building and housing department to request an inspection of the complex. And they're hoping that when the building is up for a new rental registration, that they'll first have to meet the requirements in that code uh, to get the registration, which would require making some improvements to the building. Let's go to Cleveland State University, where the school will offer voluntary buyouts for faculty and staff to help close a projected $40 million budget hole. We've been talking about budget holes at colleges yeah. all over the place. Now mm-hmm. CSU coming out with its plan. Board of Trustees approved that plan on Tuesday. And they're still working out who will be eligible for the voluntary separation program, but clearly they just need to reduce payroll. Exactly. Yeah, as you mentioned, they're facing a really big budget. Not They're not alone in this. It's it's a crisis that a lot of um, institutions are facing right now. But uh, the president, Laura Bloomberg, uh, basically said they, they don't have the full details yet. That's forthcoming. But what we do know is that it seems like the faculty members who have worked there for at least 10 years will be eligible, which if you look at the numbers, I think that's actually over half half of them um, with just that uh, eligibility alone would qualify for this. But obviously, there's going to be more parameters uh, soon to soon to come. What's, what's happening here is a demographic cliff. The uh, number of students, Cleveland State says in its analysis, from 20 to 2035, number of high school graduates enrolling in college in Ohio will drop by about 15,000. The head count dropped from 16,237 in 2018 to 13,838 in the fall of 2023. Projections from last summer say it'll drop to 13,133 students by 2027. That's what these colleges are dealing with. There was a a dip in, in babies. Yeah, there's just fewer 18-year-olds right now. And then not only that, some people are taking gap years. And then some people are saying, 
I don't know that it's worth it to go to college at this point with just kind of how the job market is. And there's this huge gap in the skilled labor, you know, industry. So some, you know, the manufacturing sector is is trying to get more young people. And so this is just going to be such a huge transformation to watch in the next few years of what the younger workforce looks like, because fewer and of course, I of course I have to mention student loans. I mean, people are again just looking at these young people in their 30s now being crippled by student loan debt and saying, "Is it worth it at this point to go to college?" Yeah, interesting. And the faculty reaction has been a lot of frustration, not necessarily because of these cuts, but because of what I just said. We knew 18 years ago this was coming, right? And so that now they're saying this is kind of this buyout is kind of coming out of nowhere. I, we wish we had more time to prepare. Is essentially. Uh, you know what they're saying. So, uh, and the other thing too that I was reading about is the former president Harlan Sands, who I believe was removed by the board um, for not having the same vision that they had, was kind of all positivity. All his his speeches were saying we're growing, we're expecting, um, you know, to have more growth and investment in the university, and now we're, we're here. So I think it's a lot of mixed information. Well, it's good to have a rosy attitude, it, but it a little is. reality should be mixed in, exactly. too, and those demographic numbers really, really point exactly. to some reality. Um, let me get into one question from Daryl about PFAS before we go to a quick break, and then we've got a lot more news to address in the last 15 minutes or so of the mm-hmm. show. Daryl asks, will PFAS regulations affect local wastewater treatment systems? And the answer is no. No, not right now with this um, current regulation that came out this week. This is specifically for drinking water. So again, with those public water systems or anyone with a private well, they, they're eligible for funding. But right now, um, there's no re- federal regulation for wastewater with PFAS specifically. Okay. There you go. Got your question answered, Daryl. Thanks for submitting yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. And we're going to take a quick break right now. We come back. We're going to talk about a whole lot more, including Governor DeWine's State of the State speech this week and some of the highlights of that with Karen Kessler. It's the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable. I'm Mike McIntyre. Stay tuned. Good to have you back here on the Reporters Roundtable. I'm Mike McIntyre with Anna Huntsman, Zaria Johnson, and Karen Kassler. And Karen, Governor DeWine delivered his State of the State, State, of the State speech on Wednesday. The speech focused heavily on education, policies aimed at Ohio's children. He announced plans for child care vouchers to help families and endorsed legislation that would limit cell phone use in schools. Karen, how would child care vouchers work and how would the state cover that cost? Well, it looks like what the state plans to do is extend a voucher program to families who make up to 200% of the federal poverty level, which is about $60,000 a year for a family of four. And the state would subsidize that. It looks like using money from the uh, federal government, uh, from the American Rescue Plan funds that the state still has available. And uh, while that is something that got some support from both Republicans and Democrats. Republicans said they are concerned about the cost, though. Democrats say they actually want that eligibility raised even more so that you've got more opportunity for people to access publicly funded child care because it's been acknowledged that Ohio really has some serious issues with regard to affordable child care and that that's something that potentially harms the state in terms of economic growth because people have to have child care if they're going to work. Uh, The governor wants there to be um, cell phone use limitation in schools. He wants that now to be a state thing before he had said he wanted districts to do it. He wants lawmakers to try again to draft a social media bill to protect children. All of these are things that he's talking about, but his relationship with those in the legislature isn't exactly rosy. Is there any chance any of these ideas of his will get any traction? I think the the cell phones in classes thing is really interesting because House Speaker Jason Stevens said after the speech that that's something that he thinks schools already have the power to do, so the legislature doesn't need to get involved in that. But then Senate President Matt Huffman, who I should note, they did these separate responses because they're likely to run against each other for speaker next year. So there's a little bit of a relationship issue between the two of them as well. But uh, Huffman said he thought it was a great idea for school to have policies that ban cell phones. So there's maybe not agreement on that, but certainly the message that cell phones are a problem, that social media is a problem for young people, especially teenagers, it has gotten through the legislature. I mean, this proposal on requiring social media companies to get parental permission from anyone under 16 who wants to use them, that was in the budget. That's now the subject of a lawsuit, and it's not going into effect in Ohio right now. But it's something that I think there are a lot of legislators who really like that idea and want to do something, you've got lawmakers on both sides who are concerned about that. 
Interestingly, the governor took a shot at the statewide bl- ban on flavored tobacco and on that hmm. whole issue. And, and, and uh, we have, at the same time, 14 cities have filed a lawsuit to block that ban on local The same tobacco. day as the state of the state, by exactly. the way. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, so th- and that, that, um, that really runs up against, um, uh, Karen, the idea of home rule. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is this battle over flavored tobacco and whether communities can ban the sale of it keeps going back and forth. DeWine has wanted a statewide ban. He says that kids, these flavored tobacco products are targeted toward kids. So banning flavored tobacco products and vapes would save lives. The legislature has pushed back. Republicans in the legislature have said this is an issue of economics, and if one community bans those things, then another community doesn't. That could be a problem. But they're not apparently willing to consider a statewide ban. Both uh, Stevens and Huffman said that was not something that they were necessarily interested in, and it's it stands to reason because they've tried twice now to ban communities from banning these products. Anna Columbus has a flavor tobacco ban already on its books. Cleveland had been going that route. State's actions seem to have impacted the effort there. And in fact, city council doesn't seem inclined to do that. But the uh, health commissioner here still says that it's necessary to have that ban lifted from the state level. Right. As you mentioned, there didn't seem to be a ton of buy-in from city council. However, um, Dave Margolius, the health director, said that um, they were also they were looking for maybe there could be some smaller provisions such as maybe the health department could inspect more local retailers or even change some age restrictions so just smaller baby steps like that they were hoping could could come down the line and now they're saying that could be impacted by um this this ban sorry it's not just that people don't like the smell of peach tobacco it's (laughs) the idea that health advocates say banning flavored tobacco can save lives. Yeah, and I read that here in Cleveland, the smoking rate is at 35%, which is significantly higher than the national average of 11%. So the hope here is that by banning that flavored tobacco, which does seem to be more accessible, I I was just out yesterday or the day before and I saw a a vape vending machine. So it's definitely Mm -hmm. out here, pretty easy to get. But um, so the hope here is that banning the flavored tobacco products would bring that smoking rate down and improve health down the line. All right. And one other thing I'd like to add from the state of the state that DeWine proposed that probably won't go anywhere was a primary seatbelt law, meaning that drivers right. could get pulled over for not wearing seatbelts. Right now, it's drivers can be ticketed if they're pulled over for something else and they're not wearing a seatbelt. That doesn't seem to have a whole lot of support among some Republicans, but it's a, an interesting thing that he put out there. Yeah, they were saying, hey, we have to have some personal responsibility here. And what, what the governor's doing is a little more nanny state stuff. Yeah, but I mean, the the evidence shows that seatbelts do save lives. The question is, do we make it so that people can be pulled over for that? And, and you know, along with driving uh, distracted and, and all the other things that are out there. All right, we've got to go. Uh, the gates have opened. We are racing now to the finish, guys, okay? <laughs> the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections is looking to move from East 30th and Euclid to the old Plain Dealer building at 18th and Superior. County Council still has a lot of questions about the plan. Zaria, one of the big pluses here is that the board would have a bunch of indoor space, actually, right. frankly, right past where my desk used to be when I worked there, for people to queue up and do indoor voting. Yeah, so that's been the big push for it, is that the current building doesn't have enough space for that indie voting in um, or sorry, early voting. Right. Waiting and do it area. indoors. Right? Indoors, waiting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so if this is approved, they'd be going from the current 173,000 square feet to about 223,000 square feet. And then there'd also be more parking outside. So the current building has 48 current parking spots available, but the new location would have 700 parking spots. So that's a big upgrade. They'd be leasing a place, though, and spending a ton of money on that. Also, the speed of it is something that county council has concerns about. The, the Board of Elections wants to do it now and have early voting there and, and the the council's thinking that might be a little bit too ambitious. Yeah, and right now county council is planning on holding early voting at the current building, but they also have said that they could revisit that down the line as this continues to progress. Um, Some council members are a little bit frustrated with that since the paperwork says that they would move after the election and they'd rather not try to force the move before November if it's approved. Um, But the election officials will be deciding whether or not this new space could be used for early election, early voting by July 1st. $91 million would be the price to lease 
um, three of the floors there until 2041. The county's response to that, the county, the county administrators who think this is a good idea, have responded, it'll cost even more than that to update the buildings we're talking about. We have people in from Health and Human Services in a bunch mm-hmm. of different places. We can close one of the buildings. So don't just look at that price tag. Compare it to what we would have paid for the other, and it's actually a bargain. Right. And they're going to be sharing the building, splitting the floors. So it might work out between sharing the cost. All right. The Playhouse Square Foundation is the new owner of the Greyhound Station on Chester Avenue. The foundation paid $3.3 million for the Streamline Moderna design building. It is really an awesome looking building and it won't be a Greyhound Station anymore. Anna? Correct. They're hoping to do more with arts and entertainment, uh, maybe even apartments over there. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be kind of part of the Playhouse Square. It's obviously in the very early stages. but uh, And this had been kind of talked about from the beginning. Playhouse Square was a little tight-lipped as far as whether they would consider that at, at first, I'm saying like a year ago. But people had from the community had been saying, hey, could we do something, an extension of the Arts District here in Playhouse Square there? And it is a beautiful building. So I'm excited to see what kind comes of it. Mm-hmm. And and logistically, all the buses that used to be there, Barron's bus, and Greyhound bus, we don't know the final answer, but we hear from RTA that it's quite likely that they will move to the Stephanie Tubbs Jones RTA Transit Center, which is right down the street. Right. It's uh, on the campus of Cleveland State University and just over a half a mile from the existing station. Um, they had initially talked about putting it on the west side, which is a lot farther away, but uh, council, city council was not very open to that. So uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to be too far. Mm-hmm. All right. I want to note this because I've heard it from a few people. If you've smelled natural gas and you're like, oh, do we have a leak here? It turns out a ton of people were calling fire departments across northeast Ohio because of this smell. And it's apparently caused by an additive that's meant to alert people to gas leaks. Natural gas is odorless, but mercaptan gives off the distinctive odor we associate with natural gas. It's added to the supply. And Columbia Gas said on its website that a supplier up the line put too much mercaptan into the gas, causing the strong odor. So mm-hmm. the calls of the fire department were, you know, people are coming out. Uh, do I, am I going to explode? And they said, you have no leak. It's just that that stuff is so intense that you're actually smelling it, even though it's not leaking. Which I could imagine is pretty scary. Very unsettling. (laughs) Yes. Residents in Ashland, Brunswick, Brunswick Hills, Parma, and Mansfield all reported the smell. And Parma fire officials said that they went on more than 30 service calls on Wednesday, Wednesday night due to all these different reports. So there were a lot of concerned residents, it sounds like, calling in about it. All right. And the advice from fire officials is? Yeah, they're saying right now um, you're it's pretty likely that you're going to continue smelling the natural gas when you use any sort of gas appliance in your home. But if that happens, they're saying to just air out your home after using your stove, your oven, or any other gas appliance like that. Yeah, I live in Rocky River, and I have to tell you, that we, we, I use the stove, and it just usually don't smell it because mm-hmm. it combusts. But I was smelling some natural gas. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's that. If it blows up tonight, then maybe it was something else. Yeah, we'll, we'll just have to see. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Mike. All right. Uh, years of planning paid off Monday. The total solar eclipse dazzled thousands throughout Akron, Cleveland, and across a swath of Ohio. Surprisingly, not just Lorain County. Click last week's show on the Internet, and you can see context to that reference. They thought they were the only ones. Anyway, <laughs> concerns over hours-long traffic tie-ups didn't pan out. Despite it being early April in Ohio, clouds took the hint and cleared out before the big event. The big question is what to do with all those eclipse classes. First thing is, I looked at the weather today and said, this so could have been yeah, Monday. Right? And I looked at the weather yesterday and said, I mean, we got lucky yeah we got so lucky it was an eclipse miracle yeah right right, truly (laughs) it was i mean it was like sunny pretty much well i'm i was down in akron and so we didn't see i know cleveland it was rainy in Mm -hmm. the morning but for the most part here it was a little bit cloudy and then as soon as it hit noon it, they just cleared away, and it was full sun. Wasn't it spectacular? Mm-hmm. It was spectacular, yeah. I, I mean, the moment itself, uh, when it started getting darker and chilly, I was like, wow, yeah. this is really cool. Karen, you were going to head north a little bit, did you? I did. Uh, my son, who wants to be a rocket scientist, actually, and finds this all stuff very interesting. I uh, wanted to go to Edgewater Park, and we we viewed it there, and it was amazing to be in a park with a whole bunch of people, and how everybody reacted to it. You know, when when the when the sun disappeared, and people were kind of yelling and everything. When the sun came back, people applauded. It was just it was wonderful. And we had a story on our website in terms of what to do with the eclipse glasses. There are organizations that collect them yeah. and are going to use them where the 
where the Eclipse might go next. Yeah, so you can drop them off at the Cleveland Public Library, the Cuyahoga County Pub- Public Library, and there are a bunch of other locations through the Cuyahoga County Solid Waste District. They're going to be sending them off to Astronomers Without Borders, who are going to oh. reuse any Eclipse glasses that are still functioning, um, sending them off to other countries that are going to experience the Eclipse sooner than we will next. Most local libraries are taking them as well, not just oh, in good, the Cleveland good. area. Oh, good, good. Yeah, perfect. Yep. All right. And um, according to Doug, who sent us an email, August 2026 in Iceland, uh, August 20 in Spain, August 2027 in Egypt and Gibraltar. You're welcome. All right. So All right. Yeah. I guess I, we're... I'm planning my eclipse tour. It sounds great. Yeah. Let us know. We can do like an idea stream day out. Somewhere <laughs> yeah. else for the Work next trip, one. maybe. Yeah. Hint, hint, awesome. Wink, wink. Awesome, too. The home opener. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was. <laughs>